We are back, my friends. Another episode of the Shema Podcast. We don't like to live on autopilot here, do we? We want to get down and find out facts. We ask questions. We get answers. We want to know why we do certain things as Jews. And I want to talk about something that is so misunderstood. And that is the subject of kosher. Now, when I first started keeping kosher or attempting to, all I had to go to was non-kosher restaurants. But I would just try to be selective on the menu. Order the fish. Order vegetables and salads. And I had many experiences like this when I was with my more secular Jewish family, friends, where I would sit down and order something. And I would say, hey, I'll take the salmon salad. And I would like the black bean soup, but there's no pork in there, is there? And the waiter would say, oh, no, 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 senor. There is no pork in there. It's like, fantastic. I'll have a bowl of that. The soup comes. I'm starting to enjoy it. And something doesn't taste right. And I asked the waiter to come back over. And I said, sir, what, what is this in the soup? And he says, oh, it's bacon. It's good, isn't it? I was like, you said there was no pork. He's like, no, 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 there's no pork. Just bacon, sir. And I would become so distraught, learning that I just once again consumed this non-kosher food. And then the people I was with would make comments like, oh, well, God will forgive you, Dan. And the other thing that I would hear all the time, too, is I would get asked the question, So are you doing kosher all the time or do you have like cheat days where you treat yourself to something? I just, I want to break down where these statements are coming from. So first, God will forgive you. And the answer is yes, we can always do teshuva, but it's coming from a place that God directed us to not eat certain foods. It was all arbitrary. He just wanted to test us and we die and we ate the bacon wrapped shrimp. And we ask God, hey, you know, I'm sorry I ate that. I did do teshuva. Was there any reason why you didn't want me to eat that? And God just says, no, I just wanted to test you guys and see if you would eat it or not. But no, it's fantastic. Good source of protein. I just wanted to test you. That was it. And if you didn't do teshuva, there's great punishment because you ignored my request to not eat the bacon wrapped shrimp. And the whole idea of, do you have a cheat day, is also coming from this type of thought process that's all arbitrary, or even better yet, as most Jews in this world think that Torah was written by men. And they were just dietary commandments created by men at that point in time, my favorite is, because there was no refrigeration. The reality is, is that these foods that God is telling us not to eat are extremely harmful for us as a Jew. You know, I got a lot of great feedback from the last episode I did with Scott Kamerman on becoming a spiritual athlete. And in that episode, I used an analogy to describe what we're doing with our spiritual growth. I built the analogy around the physical body because the physical body is analogous to the soul in many respects. And how when someone goes to a personal trainer and they begin to work out after avoiding their physical exercise for so many years, it takes a while to become conditioned. But it requires constant conditioning in order to get stronger because our body is either in a state of physical growth or in atrophy. And it goes the same with our spiritual life. Either we're pushing it and growing and creating more of an identification with our neshama over our body, or we're not doing so in the soul and the neshama is weakening inside of us. I did an episode in the past called Who is the Me with Rabbi Busco, where I asked him the question, if I'm not the body and I wake up in the morning, I thank God for restoring my neshama to me, that means I'm not the neshama, so who is the me? And the answer and summary was, it is what you choose, is how much you identify with one over the other. Because the more we connect with our neshama, the more we connect with God. Since the neshama comes from the throne of glory, it is the closest thing to our creator than anything else 
in this world, in the spiritual dimension, is the closest thing to him. And when we sleep at night, our neshama returns to the heavens. It reports, it tattertales on everything we've done during the day. The good, the bad, the ugly. And it pleads with Hashem, don't send me back. It's miserable here. One of the ways we are told through mitzvot to recognize that is when we fast on Yom Kippur depriving our body of food and water for 25 hours. And the, the way we feel our body becomes so weakened from the lack of sustenance and water is exactly how our neshama feels when we live a life void of Torah and mitzvot. When our days are filled with watching sports and the news and all the garbage through streaming media, We are starving our neshama, and it is absolutely miserable here. And every night, pleading, don't send me back. So what is the overall objective as a Jew? It is to create a hospitable environment for our neshama, to have our neshama commandeer our body and elevate it. That's why one of the most central mitzvot in Judaism for a man is bris milah. The symbol to remember that that one urge that drives most of the world, that we are supposed to commandeer it and use that aspect of our life, the area of sexuality in a very holy endeavor. So if the goal is to have the neshama commandeer the body, what I'm here to tell you is that there's a very key aspect that Torah is telling us to make this job much easier. Let me set things up a little more to give you a better idea of why this is so central and so important in our mission. Our bodies are made up of trillions of cells. And it's amazing to study biology and how they work. Each cell consumes nutrients that the blood brings it. They dispose of waste that the lymph system takes away. And even though we have trillions of cells in our body, the one in the arm doesn't know that's totally dependent on the one in the heart to pump blood through it. The cells in the brain are vital for them to exist. They all think they're independent of one another. But when we look in the mirror, we see that they're not independent. They create our entire physical being. And so we are a king over a kingdom of trillions of cells, trillions of constituents in our kingdom. The same way Hashem looks at the world and sees the Jewish people all thinking they are all independent of one another, in actuality, from his vantage point, they are one collective being. And each of those cells is built off the nutrients that we provide it. Now, in our kingdom, there is a foreign king, the Yetzirah, and we are trying to wrestle the kingdom away from him by ignoring his advice. But the problem is, is when do we know when those thoughts coming into our mind are the Yetzirah or what is our Neshama, what Hashem is telling us? One easy way is that the thought is negative towards yourself, another person, or a situation. It's the Yetzirah, always clear and cut. But there gets a lot of nuanced situations, and that's why the study of Torah is so important. So our mind is constantly knowing exactly what to do in any given situation. So there's no confusion. And we can clearly know what is the counsel being provided by the Yetzir Hurrah and what is Hashem telling us to do in that moment. But if we want to wrestle that kingdom away and banish the Yetzir Hurrah, then one of the things we have to do is make all the constituents in our kingdom, our cells, be more inclined to do what we want, to be holy. And so how do we do that? It is through eating a kosher diet. You know, when you look at the foods that are permitted to us for mammals, for instance, they have to have split hooves and chew their cud, which also means they're vegetarians. And then before we even are allowed to eat, let's say, that cow, the process for slaughtering the cow has to be done in a proper way in order to make sure that the meat we consume is good building blocks for our cellular tissue the constituents of our kingdom. So we have this process and then bleeding out the cow. Why is that so important? Because we have several layers of soul. We have a nephish soul, just like the rest of the animal kingdom that 
resides in the blood and animates all beasts, including our body. We have a neshama, as I mentioned, and we have a ruach that latches them together. And then we're in this struggle pulling our neshama down more in, into our sense of self. So when we eat, let's say, even a permitted animal like a cow and it's not bled out, what are we doing? We are consuming its nefesh soul, creating even more of a battle within us. And then, of course, if you look at non-kosher animals like a pig, pigs do not perspire. You know, we feel good if we work out and exercise because perspiring allows us to free ourselves of toxins. Pigs do not do that. And that is why it's extremely toxic animal for us to consume. So every time we eat these non-kosher foods, we are building our cellular tissue. We are feeding our constituents in our kingdom and building them off ingredients that are unholy and are food for the Yetzer Hara. So many people in Judaism just misunderstand the whole idea of kosher. They think it's a cultural norm that some people choose to do to connect with previous generations. They don't get it. So no, I don't ever have cheat days. I don't want to insert any of that into my body and make my task and my job here more difficult. And so keeping a kosher diet ensures that we are building our bodies and building ourselves in a way to make them subservient to us so we can be subservient to the king. You know, during this COVID-19 scare and this pandemic, I've seen so many Jews so fanatical about wearing their mask, wiping down their hands, making sure there's no or anything that would cause them to come into contact with this virus. Yet at the same time, they eat all this non-kosher food. If I had to choose between coming in contact with the COVID-19 virus or eating treif, I'd rather come into contact with the COVID-19 virus. I would get sick, I would feel horrible, but in the end, I would recover. And I would have control, and I would have more power and dominion over who I am. So it's, it's totally misplaced to be eating treif and be worried about things that are nearly as harmful. This, my friends, is a subject I wanted to explore in a deep way. Make sure that every Jew out there really understands the importance of keeping a kosher diet. It's not just some cultural norm that we do because we have a preference for bagels and lox and cream cheese. And other cultures may have a a cultural norm of eating other types of foods. It has nothing to do with that. It is... Our meal plan. You know, back to the original analogy I started with in the last episode. If you go in to see a personal trainer, they're going to tell you, look, if you want your body to get stronger, it comes down to diet. You have to eat the right foods. It's going to make your job a lot more difficult if you're in here working out every day and you're not digesting the right type of foods that will allow your body to build new muscle and get stronger and give you the energy to go through with these workouts and have your body recover. It is the same thing here. We have to put the right foods in our body if we're going to accomplish our mission of having our neshama commandeer the body. So I've been wanting to discuss this for quite some time, and I have a new friend through the Shema podcast, a gentleman named Brad Kernis, who reached out to me. And he was telling me this amazing story about how he coincidentally came into contact with a rabbi that changed his life. And I thought to myself how amazing it is that Hashem creates such coincidences that allows someone to meet a rabbi and begin to learn Torah mitzvot at the right time when they're open to it. So I had the opportunity to talk with this rabbi. His name is Rabbi Chaim Cohen. And him and his wife, the Rebetzin Cohen, are coming on to the show to teach us about this very important subject. I hope this is an episode you can share with other Jews to let them understand the gravity and the importance of maintaining the kosher diet. Welcome to the Shema Podcast, the podcast for the perplexed, where Torah insights intertwine through personal stories as well as interviews with leading Torah scholars demonstrate the empowering qualities of Torah and mitzvot. For more great Torah learning through Torch, the Torah Outreach Center of Houston, go to torchweb.org. Now to the show. 
Rabbi and Rabbits and Cohen, thank you so much for coming on the Shema podcast. I greatly appreciate, I know the listeners are going to appreciate you being on the show with us today. It's our pleasure. We're so excited. Our good friend told us about it and we just, we feel privileged. We're excited. Amazing. You know, we should do this episode in the merit of Brad. He should get all the merit in the midst vote for every Jew that becomes closer to Hashem through keeping kosher as a result of this podcast. Amen. And I'll just add, yesterday was Brad's birthday. And happy birthday, Brad. So may both those events, may all the merit go to you in all types of financial blessings and spiritual blessings. And I want to start too, I didn't mention this in the the intro, but Rabbi Cohen and, and Rebetzin Cohen are part of Chabad. And I always remember, I have to stop and think about, I'm talking sometimes, I could be, to Dan Coleman 10 years ago. Because Dan Coleman 10 years ago, when I was by myself, I learned the truth about Torah. I began to learn. It was Chabad's website was my first source. Like, I didn't even know what text to buy. I bought a Chumash and I started reading it. And I didn't even understand what I was really reading. So it was the commentary and all that. But I thought Habah was an organization that just developed a, a really great website with content. <laughs> I, and then now, of course, I know like it's the most amazing organization that is sends rabbis to every corner of the world to teach Torah and bring in the Jews that have been have not been exposed to it. So it's a fantastic organization. So anyway, I'm going to shut up now and I'm going to let you guys just, or if you could, since you have not been on the small podcast before, I hope you will come on again, but if you would just tell a little bit about yourself. Sure. So my name is Yehudis. I grew up in New Jersey and my husband Chaim grew up in Canada and we met in New York. My brother-in-law set us up and we lived in New York. I am a teacher by profession. I was working with the Title I program. I supervised different schools. Education has been a passion of mine for a very long time. And Chaim was, I don't know, like maybe almost like a founder or one of the, you know, at, at, a, at a startup company. So Chaim had his business. I had my, my job and we loved it. And we were living in New York. But one thing when we were dating, something that we constantly were talking about is that we wanted to live a life that was more than us, something that, you know, living for really a higher purpose. And as time went on, we, we realized if we don't start really like working towards that goal that we really always had wanted, it's never going to happen. Yeah. So we decided that we had amazing lives in New York, but we decided we wanted to do, open up some sort of Chabad center somewhere in the world. Yeah. And the search began searching literally all over the world. We were looking at options in in Poland, in London, in Florida, just, just throughout the world. In California, we flew out to California to get an interview out there. And we, we wanted to, the Rebbe, the Chabad Rebbe, I think was the epitome of Ahavat Yisrael, the epitome of loving a fellow as yourself. Now, that, ex, that idea obviously exists when it comes to physical, looking after people physically, you know, their well-being, caring for them. But it's not limited to that. It also means spiritually. And that means that if you if you have something that you know is making your life good and enriching your life, the mitzvah of Ahavat Yisrael to love your fellow as yourself is to share that with others. And that was the the, the mission statement of it's not it's not it's not exclusive to Chabad, but it is very it's a big focal point to Chabad, Chabad. And we decided we wanted to, you know, take that leap. And we I'll skip all the details because I think it's a podcast in and of itself, how we ended up here. But yeah. we basically ended up here in Loudoun County, Virginia. It's about a 40 minute drive from Washington, D.C. It's a beautiful community here. Jewish wise, not a lot going on, but there's a lot of Jews. And we started working and then we've been here almost three years. Yeah, we, we came here. We didn't know one Jewish person. We actually, we knew, we actually knew the real the realtor who we called and he had a random realtor we, we hired Jewish. was Jewish. Yeah. yeah but we, didn't, we didn't know anybody. And we moved here and we're like, boom, we're here. We're to begin. And, you know, it's incredible. There are so many Jews here, like I mentioned, and I would say pretty much each one thinks they're the only Jew here. So we feel like it's a privilege where we get to bring all these different Jews who think they're the only ones. They feel so alone and bring them together and form this beautiful community that is honestly just growing and growing and even through COVID. 
we feel privileged, we feel honored, and we're so grateful to Hashem that we have this opportunity. Can I say something that happened this afternoon? I didn't even tell you yet. Oh, let's hear. Look I was I had a meeting today at 11 a.m. with with somebody locally in a Starbucks, and we're just talking. And you know, I'm dressed like this with a little beard and a yarmulke and sitsis. I call them the walking advertisement. And uh, someone comes over to us and is like, "I didn't know there are Jews in Loudoun County." <laughs> I said, "How do you know I'm Jewish?" <laughs> they're like oh come on your yarmulke your tzitzis anyway it was great and we connected that's how we connect with so many jews out here just by it just happens things come together so well, that's how we met brad that's how we met brad in yes. starbucks amazing you spent a lot of time at starbucks which is the <laughs> of you eventually <laughs> jittery from all the coffee I, I oh, right. they yeah. went to starbucks to meet somebody and today so i think yeah starbucks is yeah. their second home we keep the, the stock of Starbucks pretty high. So many Jews that reach out to me that they start learning about Torah through podcast and these new venues, and they don't know any Jews anywhere around them. So it's great that you're out there. You're bringing them together, teaching them Torah. It's just fantastic. To me, rabbis who go out and do outreach and reach out to Jews is like the most elevated, highest position there is. Because right now in the small podcast, I am like a, a, a rabbi groupie who's in a cover band that does the intro before I bring on the real deal, which is you guys. So let's get into this subject. Teach us about kosher. You know, I know there's a lot of halakha mechanics. I want to stay away from that for right now. But let's get into the, the why. Anything you can share on that to help you understand that it's not just a preference for one food over another. I think I would start like this. The mitzvot are, I would say we can divide it into three categories, rather. There's the type of mitzvot that are called mishpatim. Those are mitzvot that we understand that make sense. Like, for example, don't kill, don't steal. This is something that any logical human being would understand. The second category is edut. Edut are mitzvot that they like commemorate something. And then there's the last category, which is chukim. And chukim are mitzvot that do not make sense. Our minds cannot grasp it. We don't understand. And kosher actually falls into that category. And I think that concept is an interesting one. Mitzvot that we can't understand, such as kosher and others. And in a way, I actually like that concept. And I'm going to tell you why. I'm going to give you an example. You know, in any relationship, let's say husband and wife, there are things that each of us like, and our partner may not understand it at all. It may even be illogical. And regardless, if you're a good spouse, good partner, you're going to do it because you know it's important to your spouse. You know that it matters and it's important to the relationship. And I think of chukim kind of in that light where, you know, there are mitzvot that we don't understand, but that's what God wants. That's what he desires. That's what he needs from this relationship. And so it's important for us to do it. And so that's just, um, I think, like almost like a foundation to kosher. That's a great point because the rest of the world will do things regardless of whether or not they acknowledge God. Many of the things that you can logically conclude, like not killing someone, as you pointed out. One of the mitzvot I learned about early on was that a Jewish man should not shave the hair off his face with a straight razor. However, it's totally fine if one cuts the hair above the skin with an electric razor. And of course, this made absolutely no sense to me, but it's the one mitzvah that I am most proud of because I just started doing it even though I didn't understand it. And and before where I was lathering up with shaving cream, pulling out the straight razor and giving myself a clean shave in the matter of minutes, now I'm standing there in the mirror with this electric razor taking considerably much more time to get not even nearly as good of a result of a shave. But several years later, after fulfilling this mitzvah, I came across an article online on the Kabbalistic reasons why the Almighty prohibited us from scraping the hair off our face, but permitted us to cut it above the skin using scissors or an electric razor. And I stared at that article and I was about to click on it and read and finally figure out why the Almighty has us do this. But I stopped and I ended up shutting down that browser with that article. 
because I realized something. This is the one mitzvah that I fulfilled it the way our ancestors did. When they stood at Mount Sinai and said, we will do and we'll hear. And this is the only mitzvah I had done the same way our ancestors did when they accepted the Torah. Everything I had done before then was, I will hear, I will contemplate, I will research, and then I'll end up eventually doing. This is the one mitzvah that I did the way we were supposed to, by acknowledging our Creator and just doing it because this is what He asked of us. So you're, you're dead on right. Like, why do we have to know the reason? That's enough of a reason. So I also want to maybe add a, add a point to that is that the mitzvahs that don't have reason do more to our spiritual refinement than the mitzvahs that have reason. It's exactly what you just finished saying. You know, when we do a mitzvah that we understand completely, so we're doing it and in the back of our mind, we're doing it with maybe a little bit more passion because we understand it. So it's like subconsciously, there's more energy to that and there's more uh, enthusiasm and interest. But when we, we do a mitzvah fully committed, I'll add one point is that there's the three big mitzvahs in the Torah, which are kosher, Shabbat, and family purity. Those are the three big mitzvahs. I would say kosher is probably more demanding than the other two because a mitzvah like family purity, without getting into all the details because it's not the focus of this podcast, but it starts at a certain time and at a certain time in a person's life, that mitzvah is no longer relevant anymore. The mitzvah of Shabbat, Shabbat is once a week. And, you know, no matter what type, well, it is a huge commitment. Let's not downplay it, but it is once a week. Kosher, kosher is a mitzvah that is from day one till the day we pass away, every single day, a whole day, kosher, kosher, kosher. So that type of mitzvah and doing it without the understanding and doing it because Hashem told us to do it makes us more spiritually re- refined. It makes us a vessel for spiritual inspiration, maybe more than mitzvahs that we don't understand. Let's talk a little bit about what is permitted and what is prohibited in the area of kosher. Let's go ahead and get into that because one of the things I found is that is where there are some logical proofs that sort of blow your mind away about the divinity of Torah, like the fish. There's nothing that exists that has scales and will not have fins. I'll say like this. This week's Torah portion is the portion of Re'e. And this week's Torah portion, Moses talks to the Jewish people about kosher again. Now, I do something called chitas, which is every day of the week, we study that week's, that day's Torah portion. So the Torah portion is divided into seven different portions. Today is Wednesday, and therefore it's the fourth portion of Re'e. And it talks about today, in today's, in today's portion of the Parsha of Re'e, it talks about the different animals that are permitted and not permitted. And obviously the Torah gives us the criteria, which are what makes animals kosher, split hooves, and choose their cut, those two conditions. And the Torah enumerates the animals, the four animals that have one and not the other. Until today, scientists have not discovered another animal outside of those four that have one and not the other. So the, who, what are those four? One is a, uh, the, the Torah first describes the three animals that, have, that chew their cud but do not have split hooves. So it's a camel, the hyrax, and the hare chew their cud, don't have a split hooves. And the pig, the swine, has split hooves but does not chew their cud. And it's interesting, Moses was in the desert. In the desert, you don't got no, uh, do they have hyrax in the desert? I don't know. <laughs> but they, uh, who knows? But the point is that till today they haven't discovered, so I think what, what you're trying to point out, Dan, is yeah. that the, the Torah, the truthfulness of the Torah, that they haven't yet found an animal outside of those four that fall, that fall into that criteria. That's exactly right. And that's what I was getting to with the fish. I mean, you have these people that always try to say that the Torah was written by man. Most of them are typically Jews. Eh. <laughs> <laughs> the arguments are always so weak, like the, the hypothesis theory. My gauntlet I throw down is, like you said, find an animal that doesn't meet those criteria. All you have to do is find one. There's millions of species out there. Find one and you will disprove Torah and we will all go home and leave the shoals. But you will never do it because it came from the Almighty. They say a story. There was a Jew eating ham in a restaurant. And the rabbi's walking by. And he sees the Jew in the restaurant eating the piece of bacon. And the rabbi is horrified. So he's waiting and waiting for Yankel to come out. And finally, Yankel comes out of the restaurant. And the rabbi says, Yankel, 
how come you're eating pork in the restaurant? How could you do this? You're Jewish. You're eating pork. <laughs> so Yanko is a little bit embarrassed. He says, Rabbi, did you see me walk into the restaurant? Rabbi says, yes. Did you see me order the pork? He says, yes. Did you see me sit down with the bowl? He says, yes. Did you see me eat it? He says, yes. He says, so Rabbi, good news is it was under, under rabbinic supervision. <laughs> <laughs> It's not so terrible. Another misconception about kosher is that it's about you know, sprinkling holy water and about, you know, or rabbinic the rabbi blessing, blessing your food. Well, exactly. And it's really not. It's really about there are many elements to this. And I think if we take kosher to a deeper level, the why of kosher, the Torah has a body and it has a soul, just like we have a body and a soul. Everything in the world has a body and a soul. And the Torah also has a body and a soul. So the body of the mitzvah of kosher are all the laws, the do's and don'ts, is what we discussed just now, what Yehudas explained about, you know, the different types of mitzvahs. That's the body. The soul is something deeper. And I think, if we can touch on that for a moment, is, you know, if, today's day and age, if somebody has a, a nutrition goal, so you go to someone that went to school to be a nutritionist, and you sit down with them, and you say, okay, here's my, here's my deal, and here's my goal, and, you know, help me get there. So nutritionists will say, okay, you got to start eating broccoli and spinach, Arugula, carrots, and why? Because nu- nutrition, you got to go to an expert and a specialist to, to teach you what exactly is good for your body. Same is true with the soul. We know God told us that for a Jewish person, spiritually speaking, this is good for you. This nourishes your soul. This is kosher. Here is a list of what you can eat and what you can't eat. And is it restrictive? Okay. You know, is the nutritionist is the nutritionist that doesn't let you eat hamburgers and French fries and I don't know what is that is that is that restrictive? No, it's it's maybe a, it's a way of looking at it, right? It's like people can look at it as like I can't eat this, I can't eat this, or they can look at it right when it comes to nutrition. Wow, I am feeding my body, I am taking care of myself. Same thing with kosher. I am feeding my soul. I am every single time I eat kosher, I am connecting to God. I am doing a mitzvah. And we're nourishing the soul. It says in Kabbalah and Hasidic philosophy that eating eating something that's not kosher is metamtem hamoach v'halev, which means it it stuffs up the mind and the heart. What does that mean? It means that we think that we are physical beings primarily with a spiritual capacity. The reality is that we are a spiritual being with a temporary physical capacity that we're in right now. But we need to be inspired spiritually. And when we eat something that's not kosher, that means our souls are like being stifled. And there's actually a story from some of the Hasidic masters hundreds of years ago where somebody was having, as they say, sveikis and amuna, which means he was having doubts in his trust in God, his belief in, his belief in God. And it's something we all struggle with even today. But back then, there was no different. And he went to his Rebbe, his Hasidic master, and he said, Rebbe, I'm struggling with, with my belief in God. And sometimes I question God, and sometimes I feel uninspired, and sometimes spiritually, I don't wake up with a morning drive. I feel dull. So the Rebbe said, go back home, and I want you to take an account and track all the food that enters your house. Perhaps there's something that enters your house that's not kosher. And he went back home, and he found out that the milk that he was receiving was not kosher milk. And he went back to the Rebbe, and the Rebbe said, these things are real that kosher food feeds the soul and nourishes the soul. And unfortunately, something, something that's not kosher can cause the soul's light to be a little bit more covered over. And I want to just add that I, I don't want people to take this from the negative, because obviously a lot of people listening probably are maybe not kosher. And it's not about, you know, kosher is probably one of the hardest things to take on. It's not about overnight change. It's about taking proper steps towards becoming more aware and conscious about kosher and that is that is ultimately doing the best thing for yourself. It's going to enrich your life. When, you're, when your soul is awake and your soul is on fire, everything about the day is a different day. So kosher is a big ingredient. No pun intended. Like many things when it comes to Judaism, Hashem, all he wants from you is the journey. He doesn't want perfection, right? He, he created us imperfect. Just go up that ladder. It doesn't matter where you are on that ladder. Just make sure you're going upwards and you're not going down. That's it. One step at a time. A micro step, it doesn't matter. Just go on that journey. There's an interesting parable or a little story they say. There was a a person that wanted to climb this tremendous mountain. Took years and years and years of training in order to begin this this climb. 
And he finally, after all the years of training, he starts on the trek. And it takes him months and months. He reaches the summit, comes to the top, and he sees there's people living up there. He's like, interesting. He walks around. He's meeting. And he sees a little child. He's like, I understand. How, how the heck did you get up here? I've been training longer than you're alive. How did you get up to this mountain? So the child says, me? I was born here. They say this story because it's like, it doesn't matter where you are. It doesn't matter where you start the journey. The question is <clears throat> the direction you're going. If you're on rung 100, but your direction is down, you're worse off than somebody on rung one and he's going up. Absolutely. We are what we eat. We become <clears throat> what we eat. And when we eat, it literally becomes part of our bloodstream. And the blood is what vitalizes every single organ and vitalizes the body. So the animals that the Torah permitted to eat are animals that are docile, not, not birds of prey, not animals that are, that are animals of prey. And yes, they're all, they are vegetarian. We become what we eat. And yes, I mean, even in today's Torah portion, there's the Ramban, which is one of the commentaries, talks about the birds of prey. And he talks about this idea that the kosher animals are docile animals and are kind, compassionate animals for the most part. And therefore, consuming them will eventually become, will eventually make you part, uh, will become part of your bloodstream and will affect your character. Right. Now, does, does science back this up? I'm not sure. I don't know. But the Torah definitely says that, that spiritually we take in the energy of what we're eating. And that could affect us. I'll say in defense of the, the scientific community is they are slowly catching up with Torah. Okay. I mean, it was just like what? Just 70 years ago that they discovered that the universe had a beginning. I mean, so there's so much about Torah that they've been just sort of discovering in the last 70 years. So give them some time. I mean, they didn't get Torah. They'll eventually come to these conclusions as well. So, yeah, I think that's amazing. There's something else I read, too, that every animal that has a split hoof and chews their cud, their artery in their vein cross on their neck right where the ritual cut is made to kill them. Every other animal that doesn't fit those criteria has the, the vein bringing blood up to the brain along the back, like humans do, and the artery bringing the body in the front. So when you kill a pig or non-kosher animal, they're dying, but they're, they still are conscious for quite some time before they bleed out. These are the things that you read when you study Torah that just show the divinity. And again, it's something given 3,300 years ago. How in the world, if it was a bunch of guys who said, we need to make some dietary laws because we don't have refrigeration yet. How would they know all these things or that there's no, we'll never find a fish that has scales and not fins. Could we get Kabbalistic a little bit? Let's do it. Because there's a big part to that as well. Let's talk about it. So let's put on our seatbelts a second, because we're about to go Kabbalistic. And nice. sometimes when we, when we go Kabbalistic, it, there, we're introducing topics that are maybe a little bit new, but I think it's, it's very, very, it's, it's all inspiring at the end of the day. So Kabbalah of kosher, let's say, let's call it that, all right? Okay. And here's what I'll say. The same reason why we have kosher and why we keep kosher and why we eat some things and don't eat other things is the same reason why the world was created. Boom, mic drop. Stay. <laughs> a hook. It's a hook. Okay. Yep, what, I'm, does that I'm in. <laughs> what, is, what does that mean? Let's, let's zoom out a second. Why was the world created? Why? It's a huge question. This, this thing is, uh, you need 17 podcasts to discuss this. But at the basic, at the core, why, the, why was the world created is because Hashem wanted, he didn't need, he wanted, to have a relationship with something outside of himself. And he created this world and sprinkled on the world human beings. And he gave these human beings free choice. These human beings have free choice to choose the right or the wrong or, 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 or the wrong way. This is what he gave us. Now, Judaism lives and dies by the principle of free choice. If we don't have free choice, so then we can't have reward and punishment. And we cannot have a proper challenge or test because there's no free choice. Judaism believes that ultimately, ultimately, free choice is only given to human beings, not to the animal kingdom at all. Just to human beings are given free choice. Now, within free choice, the mission is to elevate the physical and turn it into spiritual. Because right now we're living in a physical world, 
yet under the surface, behind the scenes, there's a spiritual energy that's going on, and we have to uncover that. We have to release and release the spiritual energy from the shackles of the physicality. Now, what does that mean? Typical example. We take something physical, we turn it into spirituality. What's the example? You go to a cow, you take animal hide, you write Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad on the animal hide, you roll it up, you put it on, you put it on your door, press mezuzah. Now, what happens to this animal hide? Yesterday, the animal hide, you could use it as a rug. Today, you put something spiritual on it. Now it carries weight. Now you can't do whatever you want. It's spiritual. You elevated the physical to something spiritual. I always say when people ask me, when they come to, we have people in the house all the time. They ask me, where's the restroom? I say the door without the mezuzah. <laughs> Why? Because the, the, cause the restroom, it's, it's holy. You can't put a mezuzah on a restroom. You don't put a mezuzah on the restroom, right? So you're, you're elevating something from the physical into the spiritual. You're elevating godly sparks. Okay, that's the general thing. And this is, this is what it is. Uh, the same example is when it comes to charity, the mitzvah of charity. Right now, when somebody works day and night to make money, and it says in, in Hasidic philosophy, it says all over Torah, that charity is equal to every other commandment in the Torah. What does that mean? Charity is equal. It says, it says that about other mitzvahs also, but let's take charity, for example. Why? Because what a person does to earn that money is they invest all their energy, all their time. It's a priority to them. They think about it day and night, and they earn money. When they take that money and they donate it to a worthy cause, donate it to Chabad if you want. Why not? <laughs> they donate it to, to a worthy cause. Right. They're elevating all that energy, all that effort, all that time, you're elevating all that. that. That's the point of creation, elevating physical things to spirituality. That's why we pray. That's why we eat. Now let's zoom into kosher. There's certain things Hashem said, certain sparks that can be elevated and should be elevated. And certain things that they're, they're not meant to be elevated by the human being. And the way we elevate them is by not engaging. And therefore, there are certain acts, not only, co- not only when it comes to eating, in general, certain things we just never, ever get close to. Why? Because there, there's two types of klipot, two types of these concealments of godly energy. Okay. One that is meant to be revealed and one that is never meant to be revealed. And when it comes to foods, there are two types of foods. There are certain types of foods that we're supposed to eat them and indulge well, maybe not indulge, but you're supposed to enjoy them and take that energy and use it for spirituality and use it to further God's mission in this world. And by doing that, you're elevating the food. And there's certain foods that, that don't have that potential. And God designed them in a way that they're not supposed to be for spirituality. You're not supposed to elevate the, the, those godly sparks. They have godly sparks, but they're not meant to be consumed and elevated. So Kabbalistically speaking, part of our mission in this world is to elevate everything. And only kosher food has that ability. There's all these different, you know, mitzvot that we get to do and something that it it's in a way so coarse and so basic. It's literally just, I mean, like on a basic level, it's to survive. We eat, we eat so that we can live, right? It's just like basic needs. And then I think what's incredible about kosher is that every time you eat kosher food, you're connecting with Hashem and it's something you're going to do every day anyways. And honestly, I think like in this day and age, they see that kosher symbol and they, they eat it and hopefully say a bracha, a blessing, maybe be mindful of that. And, and, you know, think like right now I'm connecting to God and that, that God, God loves that. God really thinks that's precious. Being conscious. Being conscious. Yes. Hey, it says that there's one type of grasshopper that's kosher. We don't know which one it is today, but there's one type of grasshopper that's kosher. And uh, speaking to somebody uh, yesterday and told me, how do we know which one it is? So I said, you got to lift the wing and look for the OU. Here's another uh, Kabbalistic uh, idea. Maybe put on another seatbelt for that. But we're going Kabbalistic again. And here's a, here's a similar idea, but just a, maybe from a different angle. You have two people lying in a hospital. One person is alive and sleeping or in a coma. And one person, unfortunately, passed away. What's the difference? You ask, you ask a, a five-year-old kid or a 10-year-old kid, they'll tell you. One has a soul and one doesn't, right? So we're made up of a body and soul. Now, physically speaking, what keeps the soul in fully enclosed in the body, what keeps the body and soul together is food, nourishment. The second you take away food, eventually the soul will leave the body. And food is the only thing that actually becomes part of us. On a, on a ba- most basic, physical, straightforward level, it becomes part of us. You eat and it becomes part of you. So spiritually, the body resembles the physical part. The soul resembles the spiritual part. And the food is what keeps everything together. So again, why is food so important? Why is food kosher so important? Because 
it keeps the body and the soul enclosed with each other. It keeps it enclosed with each other. And that's a very powerful thing. Now, what really sustains the person? So you go to any scientist or a nutritionist, they'll tell you, oh, this food has this quality. This food is protein. This one has iron. And you take the protein and the iron, the carbohydrates, and that energizes you. Okay, that's on the basic level. And at 100, that's 100% true. But maybe tearing away from the surface and looking below the surface, what sustains the person? It says, it says in the Torah, Ki lo levado adam. not only on bread does a person live, Ella, rather also al pi Hashem, by the word of God. In other words, in the food that we eat, yes, there's a physical element to all that. But what is really sustaining the person is the godly spark in the food. And I'll give you an example. We know that when you have a job, Whatever your job is, your God is ultimately sustaining the person. But the medium for the sustaining is the job that we have. The same thing is with the food. The food is the medium to enable God's energy to sustain us. So why? So getting back, why is kosher food so important? Why is it such a, a big part of what we do? Why is kosher such an important part of Judaism? Because that's what keeps the body and soul together. And when you're doing it right, that, that keeps the godly, the holy sparks elevated the holy sparks together and what that does is that elevates now if we eat something that's not kosher it's the wrong energy it may sustain you physically but spiritually it's the wrong energy we mentioned this earlier but from maybe a little bit of a different angle the jewish people when they were in the desert they got fed from god literally they had mana coming from the sky and that was their sus- that's how they survived that's what they ate after they left egypt and they were in the desert for 40 years and they when they made their blessings to god they said Lechem min hashamayim. That's what they said, which is bread from heaven. Today, when we eat, we say lechem min haaretz when we're saying our after blessings. But what's fascinating is that when you eat kosher food, right, and when you make a blessing and you elevate the food, then it becomes godly. The first blessing of the after blessing was introduced by Moses. Back then in the desert, Moshe instituted the first blessing. And yet we're saying the same after blessing now that they said then. Yet the food is different. The food then was bread from the heavens. I would say, bread from the heavens. Today we're eating food, from the ground. Yet the after blessing is the same. Why? Because of that concept that when we eat kosher food and we say the blessing, that's when it becomes godly food. It's no longer food that we worked hard and all of a sudden it gets elevated in status. Thank you so much, Rabbi and Rebetz and Cohen. I really appreciate you coming on. I know my guests do as well. If you find yourself in Loudoun County and you want to reach out to the rabbi and the Rebetzin, please do so at rabbi at jewishloudon.com. Again, rabbi at jewish, L-O-U-D-O-U-N.com. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider supporting Torch so they can continue to spread Torah wisdom to the world by making a donation at torchweb.org and clicking Donate in the top right corner of the page. And if you would like to get in contact with our host with comments, suggestions for future topics of learning, or questions for him or his guest rabbis, you may email him at president at torchweb.org.